The Christ passage in Philippians 2 is one of the richest and most elegant statements of faith about Jesus Christ found in all of early Christian literature. It's a story of incarnation, crucifixion, and exaltation. In a previous video, we discussed the topics of genre and sources, where I concluded that the text is a piece of poetic prose, uh, perhaps even a rhetorical encomium in praise of Christ, probably not a hymn. In addition, I also urge that the passage is probably pre-Pauline, a, a text or tradition that Paul himself has inherited from the early church. However, there are many other aspects of the Christ poem in Philippians 2, 6 to 11, that we still need to analyze and figure out. In fact, verse 6 contains several rather notoriously disputed texts, phrases, and, and words that we've got to talk about. We've got to look at the meaning of the form of God, you know, equality with God, and what's the deal with snatching and seizing or, you know, did not consider it robbery. I mean, all of that is still in store for us. Hi, I'm Mike Bird, and welcome to another episode of the Nazareth to Nicaea podcast and vodcast, the program where we try to break down all the questions about Jesus, faith, and the early church. This week, we are continuing our foray into Philippians 2, digging down into some contested and fairly technical questions about verse 6, specifically the meaning of the phrase, in the form of God. So what is the deal with this phrase, form of God? I mean, the Greek text reads, hos ein morphe theu hupakon. Now, there's a bunch of different English translations of that, as you can see, and you can probably read for yourself. But what is the meaning, then, of this word morphe? That's, that's the Greek word. It's normally translated as form or outward appearance. If you look at some of the standard lexicons, that's dictionaries, such as what's called BDAG, uh, they translate it as something about form, outward appearance, shape. So some sort of, you know, visible representation of something. If you go to another lexicon, what's called GE, the Greek and English one, otherwise known as BRILDAG, that lists three different functions. It's got, you know, the form, figure and appearance of something. Uh, form, appearance, and aspect, or even in a third sense, a type of species or, or, or kind or class of being. So this is a somewhat wide range of connotations this single Greek word can have. And this is where we've got to get into our first question. Does the Greek word morphe mean something like appearance, or does it imply something about a person's essence? Is it purely a visible uh, word describing how something appears to be, or does it describe the visible appearance of some sort of inward reality? Now, on the one hand, it could be the case that Jesus appears as a divine figure, as a heavenly being who has the morphe of a deity. That would imply that Jesus is the outward shape or form of a divine being, a heavenly being, not necessarily the God, just you know, a God. You know, think of you know Psalm 84, where Yahweh is God of gods. And then you've also got all those various creatures in heaven who are meant to be bowing down to Jesus. So maybe Jesus has the form of one of these heavenly divine beings. Or you could even say that just as the, uh, the beings of the Greco-Roman pantheon had a divine form, they could metamorphosize and appear in human form. Maybe that's what's going on in this Christ poem. Maybe Jesus is a divine being like a, a Zeus or an, an Apollo who goes from the divine form and metamorphosizes into a human form. That means Jesus went from the form of a divine being to the form of a servant. And so it goes on such a reading, Jesus is a heavenly being who possessed a divine form, the visible appearance of a heavenly being, and then adopted the visible appearance of a human being, even becoming a slave. But this divine form, so it goes, has nothing to do with Christ's divine nature, divine person, divine identity, let alone anything like a divine essence. That would mean that the phrase morphe theu, a form of God, 
it's 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 all about the epiphany of a heavenly being it's not talking about ontology the, the real nature of who or what he is it's about the appearance of a heavenly being metamorphosizing and appearing in the form of a human being so one heavenly entity in heavenly form taking on human form so that's that's one way of thinking about it it's simply a matter of appearances whether divine or human that's where the morphine language could go but on the other hand maybe jesus does not just appear in the outward appearance of divinity or being a heavenly being maybe he appears in the morphe theu the form of god because he is in reality inwardly truly by essence a divine being a divine person now there is some lexical evidence for this uh, there's one 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 dictionary what's called luanita uh, which operates on the basis of semantic domains uh, in that dictionary it's argued that the uh, the word morphe talks about the nature or character of something with an emphasis on both its internal and external form both its nature and its character both what it is and what it represents itself to be so some would argue on the basis of the of word usage that it can be an outward reflection of something interior uh, in the septuagint that's the greek translation of the old testament there's not a lot of references to god's morphe god's form there's a couple of exceptions in job 4 and in wisdom 18 but what you do find a lot in the old testament is a emphasis or a uh, very colorful description of god's radiant appearance that's his outward form but that that glorious appearance of god is meant to be an expression of god's own glorious divine nature so you could argue that in the old testament can you really separate god's appearance with god's own identity is god's glorious uh, radiance really separable from who god is as the glorious god of israel uh, a third thing that makes us think that maybe morphe is somewhat connected to the idea of being or on to ontology is that paul includes the participle form of hupako which means to exist which is explicitly ontological language no he was being in the form of god i mean that's making a pretty strong ontological statement he, he, di he didn't appear like the form of god he he wasn't kind of sort of close to the form of god he really exists he has a being which amounts to the visible form of israel's deity uh i'll also argue and this is kind of a fourth point here that the phrase form of god and equality with god are set in parallel I'll have to argue that in some coming weeks, but, but I think that pretty much holds. I think there is a parallelism going on here. A fifth thing I want to point out is the way that Plutarch, who's a, who's a Greco-Roman author from the first century, and Philo, a Jewish author from the first century, they both describe uh, divine beings using this language, or in some cases argue that someone is not divine because they don't have the form of God. I mean, to, to give you an example of that, Philo says that the form of God is not a thing which is capable of being imitated by an inferior form as good currency is not replicated by counterfeit coinage. And there he's talking explicitly about the Roman emperor Caligula, who thinks he's divine. He may dress like Ares or the god Mars, but he resembles Ares in neither reputation nor in nature. So what Philo is saying is uh, Gaius Caligula, you know, the roman emperor he shouldn't go around telling everyone he has the form of god because he doesn't have the true nature of a divine being somewhat similar here is plutarch uh, he writes a lot about religion in the ancient world and he says the the goddess isis uh, her relationship to creation is very much like that of uh, a divine being and its image and he says that the divine offspring is an image, an icon, and a copy of the divine being. I mean, he says explicitly, for creation is the image of being in matter, and the thing created is a picture of reality. So in that little quote from Plutarch, you can see how there's a description 
of what something is represented as representing uh, a divine being. So what is represented is still some sort of participation in the divine being, or it represents the divine being in some form. Uh, we could also talk here about reception history. When the church fathers were interpreting this passage in light of the debates they were having, very often they connected it with discussions about a divine nature, about divine personhood. So I don't think this poem is saying, uh, with form of God, that Jesus is just a heavenly being of some kind with a divine appearance. He swaps it for a human appearance. I think this passage is saying that Jesus is the visible expression of God's own glorious self. So I think there is indeed an ontological aspect going on here. And I would even argue there is some justification to the gloss provided by the NIV, who, who, who translates it this way, who being in very nature God. Now, that's not just a translation, that's an interpretation, but one that has some kind of justification. Second, the next question that verse 6 throws up for us concerning form of God is whether it supports an Adam Christology. Let me fill you in on some gaps in scholarship, okay? Some scholars have argued that when Jesus is called the Morphe Theu, the form of God, that's pretty much the same as calling him the image of God. Uh, and what that means for some scholars, like the late James Dunn and the late Jerome Murphy O'Connor, is they think, look, there's, there's no reference to pre-existence here. It's not talking about a pre-existent heavenly being. Rather, Jesus is depicted as the new Adam, because form of God, image of God, it's pretty much the same thing. So when this Christ poem says that Jesus is in the form of God, that's just the same as the image of God. And it's saying no more other than Jesus is a new Adam. Just as the first Adam was in the image or form of God, so too Jesus, the new Adam, is also in the image or form of God. And Jesus, unlike the first Adam, does not snatch after equality with God. And that would mean it's not talking about a divine Christology of a heavenly being who becomes human. It just means Jesus is the new Adam. He is the true human being who does not snatch after divine honors. He does not arrogate himself in a way that the first Adam did. Now that's been a little bit popular in scholarship, but I don't think it works for a number of reasons. Uh, first and foremost, uh, if you read Genesis 1 to 3, Adam did not snatch or seize after equality with God. I mean, he wanted to be like God in knowing good and evil. I mean, it's, it's a bit of a stretch to call that snatching after equality with God. Uh, the other thing we can know is that, or we should note, is that in the Septuagint, the Greek version of the Old Testament, the Greek words morphe and icon are not really treated as synonyms. Um, you know, there's a particular, you know, a Hebrew word or a suite of words that could be used for the divine image, you know, selim, but the words icon and morphe don't vary in being used for it. It's pretty much the word that's being used to translate it is icon. Even Bart Ehrman, you know, uh, who's certainly no friend of uh, early high Christology, even he rejects the idea of there being a kind of Adam Christology here. Now, that's not to say that Paul cannot compare Jesus to Adam and describe him as a new Adam. You find that very explicitly in Romans 5, in 1 Corinthians 15. But most scholars do not think that there's an Adam Christology in Philippians 2, 6. That's generally the consensus, which sounds good, doesn't it? But there is a very big catch. Some time ago, I came across a very interesting article by George Van Kooten, who makes a good point. Uh, he says, yes, look, in the, in the Septuagint, icon you know, for image and morphe for form, they're not synonyms, but they do belong to the same semantic domain. They both do, uh, do relate to each other as kind of cognate terms for the outward appearance of something. So, yeah, by all means, if you want to restrict yourself to the Septuagint and how it's used there, yeah, they're, 
they're kind of used distinct, but deep down in, in any Greek lexicon, we know they both belong to the same semantic domain. And in fact, Van Kooten even finds one text where these two words are used together, where they are set in par parallel. And that is in the Sibylline Oracles, book three. Uh, there it says, and it's talking about creation, it says, men who have the form which God molded in his image. Hear that again, that's from Sibylline Oracles, book three, verses eight to 10. Men who have the form which God molded in his image. So that means human beings have a morphe from God, which represents the divine icon, the divine image. So for many Jewish authors, God's morphe form is reflected not in idols, but in human beings as God's own icon, God's own icons. Now, given that similarity, the fact that form and image in Greek morphe and icon are similar enough, maybe you could get an Adam Christology that way. Maybe these words are not technically synonyms, but maybe they're cognate enough that they could be used interchangeably. And we can bolster this argument even further. Philo, again, that Jewish philosopher from Alexandria in the first century, uh, he said human beings are not strictly made in the image of God. They're made in the image of the heavenly logos. They're made in the image of God's, you know, ultimate word, because, you know, no one can really reflect to God who God is and that type of thing. So they're, they're made in the image of the archetype of uh, mediation. And that would mean Adam is an image of a divine form that is represented in God's word. Uh, now, if you apply that, that same kind of thinking to Philippians 2.6, you could then have an allusion to Jesus as an Adamic figure. That's what, that's what James Dunn argued. But you could still have pre-existence against Dunn because what you could do is argue that Jesus is the pre-existent heavenly Adam after whom the earthly Adam was patterned or created. And that actually makes sense if you then jump to 1 Corinthians 15, particularly when you get to verse 49, where it says, just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we will also bear the image of the man of heaven. Now note that contrast, the image of the man of dust and the image of the man of heaven. Paul uh, neatly, discreetly distinguishes the image of the man of dust, Adam, from the image of the man of heaven, which is Jesus. So maybe Paul is saying Jesus as the heavenly man is also the form of God and the image of God. And we're going to be eventually conformed to the ultimate image of God, which is the glorified Christ. Taking all this together, theoretically, it could mean that the, uh, the Philippian Christ poem is saying that the pre-existent Jesus is the heavenly Adam who bears the image or form of God. I think um, Van Kooten has shown that definitely is a possibility. You know, most people wrote that off because icon and morphe are not synonyms in the Septuagint, which is true. But if you cast the net broader, look at semantic domains, look at a little bit of Philo, you know, we're made in the image of the, of the Logos, not the image of God. Paul's contrast of the image of the man of dust and the image of the man from heaven, you know, maybe, maybe there is an Adam Christology going on here. Uh, now, I'm not 100% convinced of that, but I do think it's worthy of consideration. I do think we need to have uh, a second look at it, that maybe by describing Jesus as having the form of God, maybe it means he is the heavenly man, the heavenly Adam, um, after whom humanity is patterned in creation and to whom humanity will again be conformed at the last day. And, and, and that has the plausibility in light of semantic domains, what we saw in uh, Sibylline Oracles book three and what Paul himself says in 1 Corinthians 15. So there is some plausibility to that. Let me sum up though. Uh, when it comes to the phrase, the form of God, I think this refers to Jesus as the outward expression of the divine being. Uh, this is not a statement that Jesus is merely one divine being among many who can also appear and metamorphosize in human form on earth, 
I think this is an outward display of divine form because he is divine in his being, his hupako, and his being existing in uh, the form of God. And he represents something of the being of the God of Israel. Uh, what about an Adam Christology? Uh, well, I, I don't like the arguments of Dunn and Jerome Murphy O'Connor who want to say there's no reference to a heavenly existence or pre-existence here. It's just saying that Jesus is a new Adam. I think that's wrong. And George Van Kooten shows that, you know, maybe you can have Jesus as the heavenly Adam, the one after whom humanity is created and patterned. Well, that's what we've seen this time around. Um, when it comes to looking at the Philippian Christ hymn, that enigmatic phrase, the form of God, the morphe theu. Next time, we're going to look at another contested phrase in verse 6. We're going to keep ourselves in verse 6. We're going to look at the phrase equal with God. Is that purely an honorific term? Or is it, again, a statement of ontology? Is it about Jesus' status or about his divine nature? All that and more to come on the next episode of the Nazareth to Nicaea podcast and vodcast. Hey, until then, do me a favor. Uh, subscribe, share, like, leave a review, a comment, or a question. And uh, if you do leave a question, I'll try to get back to you in the fullness of time. Otherwise, I look forward to seeing you around the channel.